Welcome to the next video in the Suggestion App course. This is a complete course where we'll build a .NET 6 Blazor server application with MongoDB from the ground up. There are three things you need to know before we get started. First, this is part of a series, and this isn't the first video in the series. If you're just starting out, you should check out the playlist that's linked in the description to start from the first video in the series. Second, this course is actually a paid course. MongoDB sponsored it so you can put the videos on YouTube for free. Check out the link in the description to sign up for MongoDB Atlas for free to thank them if you haven't already. Third, you can also buy this course on imtimcorey.com. The link is in the description. Buying this course will get you all the lessons right away, the source code for each lesson, a certificate of completion, offline access, and more. It also helps sponsor more free content. The video will be the same as it is on YouTube, so feel free to watch the free version if you want to. Okay, let's jump into today's video. Note there may be more than one lesson in this video, since some lessons are short. Now we have a basic idea of what our application is going to do, let's open up the requirements a bit more and really look under the hood and see, see what's going on here and what are the things that are implied but just aren't listed. Now what I have here are two different notepad documents. I have my questions documents and I have my features documents. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna talk through this application again. And this time we're gonna kind of pick out various pieces. And we're gonna say, okay, where does this fit? And do we understand what's going on here? For instance, the first question I would have as I look at this is, how are we going to make sure that a user can actually create a suggestion? Because it would seem like we'd have to have some type of authentication and authorization system to allow them to create suggestions. If it's just a anybody can create suggestions, then we come down here where we see author screen name. What's the limitation there? So how we know that they're actually, oh, I just got rid of my, um, my documents here, how we know that they are actually them. And how do we keep track of that and allow only the people we want to have access? Because are we going to want to have a limitation here on who can post suggestions? So let's start off with, um, do we want authentication? authorization? And the answer is yes. Yes, we do. Now I'm answering these questions because not only am I the developer, I am also the project stakeholder. I'm the person that's asking for this project. In a real world scenario, that's not always the case. It can be, but it's not always the case. It may be that you were assigned to this project or this is part of what you do at work. Well, then you have to go and ask these questions of the person who does control the project. So these questions I would take to the project stakeholder and get clear answers on. Now, depending on your environment, and here's a little best practice tip here. Depending on your environment, I would almost always recommend that you get these questions in writing and get the answers in writing from the project stakeholder. The reason why is because when you produce the final application and they say, well, I wasn't expecting that. And you had asked that question and they answered it and you had accomplished what they asked for. You can say, well, this is what you asked for. And this is what I gave you that way. It's not a combative thing, but what it is, is a protective thing for you. Protect yourself. Make sure that everyone is clear on what the application will and won't do and make sure everyone signs off on that. That way there's no forgetfulness later, which can happen. It's not necessarily malicious. It's just something that happens when a person goes, oh, I didn't remember saying that. But now you see it in writing, you can see, oh yeah, I did say that. And that's what you did. So maybe it's not what I want now, but I can't be mad at you for making what you asked me to make. So questions. Question number two here would be, um, do we want to limit 
what questions a person can ask. For example, um, rate limit, meaning can you ask a thousand questions in a day? Is that okay? How about um, the idea of offensive content? I haven't, maybe should I, that should be a separate uh, point even. So let's put it as this. So offensive content filter, where maybe you post something that's really not a question. Maybe it's more like, this is stupid, I hate this. Well, that's not a suggestion. That's just a complaint. And this isn't the forum for complaints. Or maybe, and here's another one I can see happening quite often, is that a person says, okay, suggestion for a future video. Well, you see, I've been assigned this project by my professor. I would like you to do this project for me. That's not, that's not what a suggestion, a video suggestion is. So that would probably be something I'd filter out. But how we do that? Well, those are the questions to ask. Because you need to understand, are we going to worry about that or not? Because if I, as a private stakeholder, say, no, let's not worry about that. And then when we push this to the production and a person asks that question, I don't want the private stakeholder to come back to me and say, hey, why aren't you stopping this? Because we have asked the right question and gotten the answer. So we're going to talk about offensive content filters. So for features, this is where the two of these are linked is the questions and the features. Questions will bring out features. So for instance, for uh, version one, I do want to have the ability to approve, deny questions, okay, as an admin, which that indicates something else. And that is we need to have authentication, authorization. Now, if you're not familiar with the difference here, authentication is the idea that you sign in that you say, hey, this is what my username and password is, and it says, yep, you're right, you're signed in. That's authentication. Authorization is now that you're signed in, what level of permission do you have? Now, sometimes an app can have just authentication, where you say, hey, as long as you're authenticated, you're good to go. And sometimes you're gonna have authorization levels. For instance, we just saw that we need an authorization level in the previous feature, approve or deny questions as an admin. So an admin will need to be able to sign off on a question being permissible. Then I'll just keep a site cleaner. So we now have a couple more features for version one beyond what we saw in this initial document. Now, I do have the future versions feature as well. And that's the idea that there's some things that come up where we're like, man, that'd be a great idea. Not going to do it. And I can tell you, since I've already built this app once, that as my team and I went through this and we, we worked on things and, and clarified things and made sure it worked, we came to the conclusion that there's a lot of things that aren't on the version one. In fact, I had a number of great ideas for my team. They're like, let's do this. And I would say, great idea, no. Because it's not a version one feature. It's something we want to do after we get out the door. Because it's not part of that primary focus of creating and viewing suggestions. So version one features that we're adding, approve and deny questions and admin, and then authentication and authorization. So other questions we can ask about this information. Well, how about this? Do or can we add new categories or statuses? Well, I think for now, the answer is no. Because when we get started, we're going to have to focus on keeping as, as focused as possible on creating suggestions, 
on viewing suggestions and uploading suggestions. That's our primary focus. So adding in a mechanism to create new categories or statuses doesn't seem like it fits in the, the scope of version one, but it's a great idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to say add categories, add statuses. I'm going to break those two apart because we may decide adding categories is something that's a version 1.1 thing where add statuses might be a never thing because a status doesn't seem to change as often. The status is things like we've archived it, we've dismissed it. It's an upcoming thing where we're watching it or it's complete. Those are our states of being. They're not necessarily things we'd add to. Whereas a category, right now we have YouTube video, but we have 10 minute training and we have in-depth Monday videos. So those are two different kinds of videos. Maybe we, we expand that. We probably will even for version one, when we first create the categories. But beyond that, what if there's others we add later? Maybe there's a, a different type of video I start doing. Well, we'd want to have a category for that. That seems like something that we would add later on as we go. So for right now, it's not a version one thing, but it is something that would go into a future version. Now, this process, we want to keep going as talking through the various bits here. So let's go back over our questions, go to question five. And what else do we see about this that, that doesn't make sense or is missing? Now, the way to figure this out, if you aren't skilled at doing this, if you haven't done this a long time, and I have done this for a long time, but... Even so, what I do is I walk through it manually. So I would take a design document, which is, this is a very, very, very pretty design document. Normally it's a wireframe. It's probably on a whiteboard and it probably has smudges and smears all through it. But what we're going to do, I would take that design and I'd physically go through and touch each spot where I would say, and you might be able to make a cursor, but I put out my suggestion, suggest button and say, I make a suggestion. Wait, no, no, I wouldn't. What I would do first is I would go through and search for my suggestion. So I would say, okay, let's filter by courses only. I'd click on courses and then let's do a search. Now I'd search in this search box here where I'd say, okay, I want you to, um, you know, I'm looking for Redis, for stuff on Redis. And I'd type Redis in there and see if there's any courses. And then if there's not, I would click on the suggest button and then bring me to here and I'd fill in. I want to learn more about uh, Redis caching and it's, I want it to be a course. And then I describe a little bit more about the course I want to see, maybe Redis in action, maybe see Redis with uh, Docker and Azure and a few other things. And I hit suggest. And then what happens? Does it go immediately in this list? Well, we've already said that we're going to have an approved deny process. So no, it doesn't go in this list. Where does it go? Well, it seems like we're missing something. So we have an approved deny questions as an admin, which means we need to have, let's put it right afterwards, a uh, some type of admin approval screen. That's something we don't even have a design for yet. But we need to have something where we approve or deny uh, pending features. So that's, or pending uh, suggestions. So that's another feature to add to our list. Well, now that we're on a screen, we have to visualize it in our mind and it gets approved, what happens? Well, it, it shows up here. Well, until I make, until that happens, because it won't happen immediately, how do I know that my suggestion went through? Well, there's going to be a way somehow, right? Well, that's probably, we got to have some kind of page that's my suggestions or my uh, information. So a question we can ask is, where do we show off 
or should we show off a user's contributions? Meaning, do we have some type of thing where we say, hey, here's the suggestions you've posted. Here's the ones that are active, meaning the ones you'd see on this page, this suggestion page. Here's the ones maybe with the different statuses like completed or upcoming or watching and how many votes they all have and stuff like that. But then maybe there's ones for pending, ones that where I've gone through, I've filled this form out, I've made the suggestion, but now it's in the waiting process, waiting for that admin to approve or deny it. And then there's probably questions where it didn't make the cut. Maybe it's a homework question. Maybe it was a very specific coding question where I posted code and said, can you fix this? That's not a suggestion. So that might get denied. Well, where is the denied listing? How do I know that got denied? Well, I think that's where, again, it have to be on some type of screen to show off the user's contributions where it says, hey, here's the things that have been denied. So I think what we need here is we need to have some type of user profile page. So some kind of page where the user can see all their various contributions and what state they're in. Okay, so that's how to walk through the application step by step, asking questions about, well, where is this stuff? Okay, so now we have the ability to go through and see our profile and maybe we can see those things that we've, we've contributed already. And when the admin approves it, it, gets, it, gets, it goes here. And then I go to, oops, I clicked on it again. Um, I go and I click on this to upvote, right? So it says click here to upvote or just has upvotes. And so I click to upvote. How does it know? This is a question to ask. How does the system know if I have voted on a top on a suggestion? Because we assume that it knows, right? Well, I'm assuming, and this is this is a valid assumption, but I'm assuming that this blue filled in box here indicates that I've already voted on it. Whereas this white box indicates I have not yet voted on it. And the gray indicates no one's voted on it yet. So how do I, how does the system know that I voted on it? Which means that we need to, as a, a feature or version one feature, track the user's votes. So we know when a person has voted on something. That way you don't stand here and just click on your suggestion over and over and over again and give it 10,000 votes. But that also raises another question is, can a user vote on their own suggestion? And you may say, well, that's an obvious answer. Is it though? Because I can tell you on my team, we had a fairly vigorous debate on this because there are two sides to this coin. One, if you make the suggestion that in itself is a vote. You're saying, this is what I'd like to see. So it's already a vote. But then if you don't click on the vote of your own suggestion, the other argument is, well, then you don't show confidence in your own suggestion. So if even you're not confident enough to vote on your own suggestion, then, then why would should anybody else? Which I can understand to an extent, but the other part of it is, do we really want to be tracking what's your suggestion versus somebody else's suggestion? Because this gray one right here says click to upvote. But if it's your suggestion, it shouldn't say that, right? It should say something else because it's, you can't click on it to vote because it's not yours to vote on if we don't allow you to vote on your own suggestion. You see the complicated logic there? So that's why we had this debate over, is it important? Is it a version one feature 
to not allow voting on your own? Or is it a future version feature? And do we even care if a person votes on their own or not? Now, I can tell you the answer we arrived at is that no, a user cannot vote on their own suggestion, and that is a version one feature. And the reason why is because we're going to track the user's votes. We don't want to create the mess of having the, a person be able to vote on their own suggestion and then lose that ability later. We also don't want this weird situation where some people don't realize they can vote on their own suggestion. And so just by voting on your own suggestion, you put it ahead of a crowd of people who have got, got no votes yet, which would move you up the popularity list. So we came to the conclusion that, no, you cannot vote on your own suggestion. But it's not as simple as just, well, that's obvious, because there's a lot more to think through. Okay, we've talked about voting. We've talked about seeing your own profile. We've talked about the, the admin approving suggestions that come to this list. What are the things we're missing? Well, I've got a question for you. Where do you log in? There's, there's no place here that says log in. There's no place anywhere that says log in. Or that you're logged in. So I think a future ver or a version one feature needs to be a login slash account slash log out option or options. That's pretty important. Being able to log in, log out. Okay, so those are version one features. Let's talk through, do we have any other questions to ask? I think we've, we've covered the, the big ones here. Um, let's talk through now the, um, the suggestion page, the, the make a suggestion page. What things do we need to think through when we're looking at this form? Well, I think we should ask the question at least, should, we limit the size of suggestions and descriptions. And I can tell you the answer is, oh yes, yes we should. Because, if I come back up here, you'll notice that this is the max title size at 75 characters, which is generous, but not huge. That was what we came up with in our design. And we're gonna stick pretty, pretty close to that, if not exactly that. Because if we make it too big, then it's going to make our these cards here just ugly. So we're going to limit that to 75 characters. It also is going to encourage people to be brief. One of the dangers of allowing unlimited text or even a lot of text when it comes to a suggestion is that people will ramble and they will create a a scenario and explain the scenario and not really focus in on these are the things that I want to see. And the danger there is that a rambling title does not get enough views. Because a person's gonna look at that and go, oh, it's a paragraph of information, that's too much, and skip right over it. Therefore, it won't get votes. Therefore, it won't get done. So, being concise is important. We're going to encourage that through short titles. And by short, I mean 75 characters is still a lot of information. But we're going to limit to that much for the title. The description will probably make that larger. So yes, we're going to limit the size of a suggestions and descriptions. And let's put that over here for version one features. Okay, we'll limit the size of the title and description of our suggestion. Now, what else should we talk about? Well, let's go back here. We can see that that's pretty much all we need to see here. Let's look at the make a suggestion list. And this is where we see the title, the author, we see the date it was posted, the number of votes, and we see the description. Cool. And then down below we have this 
the tag there for the status of completed with a little message. That raises a question that hopefully you've already seen, and that is, let's go over here to number nine. How do we, how do admins add a status to a suggestion? Okay, because I think that's important. If we can't add a status, then we don't have any statuses because we're not going to allow users to add a status, correct? I would think not. Otherwise, a user would say, yeah, this is the upcoming video. I'm going to make sure that Tim does this next. That's not, that's not realistic. So that needs to be a pretty high priority if we're going to have statuses. So if we're going to have these statuses, then we need to have in version one, the ability to, um, for admins to add a status to a suggestion. And in the event of a completed status, we probably need that, uh, that note as well as to the URL where that suggestion is located. So with a note, so we'll say why it was um, upcoming or why it's completed or why it was dismissed or archived. And that brings up the next question. So let's go over here and say 10 and say, okay, um, what happens when the list gets huge? Okay, right now on our sample site, it says 345 suggestions. Cool. But what happens when we have 3,045 suggestions or 30,045 suggestions? That's an awful lot of suggestions, especially to display on a web page. And yes, we are planning on making this a web project. So how are we going to do that? Well, I think what we need is a way to clean up the site where we can archive suggestions. Maybe they're just old and stale and no one really seems to be interested in them. Okay, so maybe after, you know, three months of no one voting for it, we go, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. So we just archive it. Or maybe it was completed six months ago. We go, okay. This is not a place to just, you know, keep it forever. We'll go ahead and archive that complete element so that, you know, it, it just cleans the site up and it's focused on the stuff that's more current and relevant. Okay. So we need to have some way. And again, this is going to be an admin thing. For archiving suggestions for getting them off the main page so that we can keep this page focused to the current relevant suggestions. Okay. So that'll be the way to keep this list from getting huge. So I think those are the major things that I have thought through just off the top of my head when looking at this design. Now, more stuff is going to pop up guaranteed. It's going to happen. And having built this application already once, I can tell you more stuff came up, but this is the stuff that you walk through when you're trying to open up those requirements. You ask the questions like on the left. And again, if I wasn't the stakeholder, I'd be going to the stakeholder and getting these answers so that we are clear on things. But then you have on the right, your features and you, you kind of break apart. Is this a feature for version one? or is this a future version feature? Now, I'm gonna keep this list and I would keep it going throughout the life of my, my build process because you'll find a lot more things that go into this, this features list, whether it's the version one features or the future version features. So I would keep a running list of, hey, this is not for now, but we need to have this. Hey, I think it's a great idea. Let's put this in the, in the, the future version features. And this list right here will grow a lot. 
my encouragement to you is to primarily put things in that list, not in the version one features. If any of these features are not absolutely necessary for your first version, move them out. And I know you can say, well, but I want to have a great, you know, put my best foot forward. I want to make sure that the, the application works right the first time and so on. I can tell you that a working application puts a much better foot forward than an application that's always just about to launch, but never does. And you, just making your application too big is going to introduce too many bugs because bugs are going to happen. So the smaller it is, the less bugs you're going to have because the more you can thoroughly test every part of it and you can you know, expand it slowly from there. You want to have that iterative process, not this, this waterfall process where we build the entire full application with all the bells and whistles over the course of two years and then launch it for the first time. Because that, I can tell you, is going to cause you major issues. So start as small as possible. Get just enough out the door to have it working and working well. And then iterate from there. So whenever possible, move things to future versions. Be ruthless about it. So with that, we've gone through the, the steps of opening up the requirements now. Next up, we're going to talk about user interface design.